Welcome to Verify in Field, the Millwork Podcast. Your host, Jacob Edmond, CEO of Duckworks, will be interviewing experts in the industry to bring you insights and knowledge about the latest trends, techniques, and challenges in millwork. Whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, this podcast is for you. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the world of millwork. Here's Jacob. We've got uh, Lenny Sienna here, who is the head of product engineering for Microvellum, um, as well as Jamie Broadbent joining from Australia, right? You're in Australia today? I am indeed, yes. Who is a product engineer three at Microvellum and uh, very instrumental in uh, library development for um, the users down under, as well as a lot now that's uh, merged in. And then Hayden... Uh, you'll have to forgive me. Is it Scan? Hey, Sean? Sean. Hey, Sean. Okay. Uh, who's a new product engineer at Microbellum. So um, we're going to dive into today's topic, which is Microbellum's foundation library. And um, and so to start out, um, you know, if you guys, Lenny, if you wanted, I think it'd be good to just describe and explain what is... Um, the foundation library, you know, for our audience who maybe aren't Microvellum users or um, are familiar with Microvellum, but they're not the, the you know, the core users within their company. Sure, yeah. I mean, there's kind of a quick answer. is It's just a brand new library that's been rebuilt from scratch, from the ground up. You know, we figured it's been 20 years. Um, I mean, probably a good time to hit the reset button, if you will. Probably I could do a quick little history um the first library the first library was developed obviously 25 years ago when microvellum was first developed and you know it, it one underwent various changes over the years uh it was basically just evolving you know, over these two decades as it passed through various different developers who how kind of they all put their own spin on it and parallel while that was happening um over in australia so jamie's uh, can, it was it was part of this, so they were also developing, like a, if you will, a branch um, that was developed for that market. And so it was kind of fascinating to watch from a distance of how the two libraries kind of evolved in just different ways. And that went on, like I said, about two decades until about uh, in 2019, it, we finally hit the reset button. We, we did it, and um, kind of why we did it is. I mean, we we really just nuked the old ones, <laughs> like, and and we were kind of what was happening. We were just wasting a lot of valuable time, or we were developing stuff, they were developing stuff, and we couldn't share with each other, and that was co- taking up really valuable development resources because you know it takes a team of people to do all the development and, and to support each of the libraries. You know, like we would develop something and they couldn't use it, and vice versa, they would develop our drawer system and we couldn't use it. So we literally were doing that. So some other reasons, um, it was also creating market confusion. You know, people would see a video online and they would become confused, like, well, what? It doesn't look like my library, you know. So around 2017, 2018, we kind of debated on if we could even do this. It took us a couple of years. We talked about it. Um, I had all these reasons why it would never work. And um, I was very skeptical, <laughs> but, you know, with some determination and planning and help from the development team here, we kind of overcame each of the obstacles. And so in 2019, we started um, kind of as a proof of concept as a new office furniture library where it was from the scratch, built from scratch. And we basically took everything that we liked in the North American library um, and everything we liked in the Australian, New Zealand Library that they, they called theirs the premium library for those his, his, you know, historically accurate here. And then we had what was it, advanced frameless, and then it was the component library. So we took elements of both and and put them together and took all the stuff that we learned, the do's and don'ts, and made a whole new one. So that's how we ended up now with this brand new internal structure. It's not just like an update. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's like that was part of the problem is it had been updated so much that, you know, we were just tacking on 
things like this and it got bloated and things were kind of convoluted and we didn't really get a chance to, to kind of rethink things um, really from, from scratch and when directions that we wanted to take it. Ultimately the foundation library um, is essentially a, um, a reset. It's a brand new and, and would you say it's the first full reset every, you know, iteration and, in previous libraries, it was kind of cumulative, right? Um, yeah. And there were mul- there were two or multiple parallel libraries. There was the North American, right? Um, yeah. Which the latest version was a component Fif- library. Yeah, and it went to fifty point seven. Was that last version when we when we kind of paused or, or stopped development? And there was a fifty point seven North American library as well as a Australian library. Yeah, they called theirs was the premium. I don't remember what version it was. Uh, Jamie, I don't know if you uh, I think remember. We got uh, uh, version twenty. I think it was. Yeah, we got to, but um, yeah, exactly what Lenny said. We we got to a point where it was just too many resources trying to um, service so many libraries. Um, you know, we had the UK as well, and even China and a few other places. So we just wanted to consolidate all the libraries and pretty much make it a regionless library and a unitless library. Because, um, as we all know, the North American, that you use the imperial system and we have metrics. So that was a massive challenge as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, awesome. I think that's a good introduction. Uh, I want to take a second, though, and also introduce and talk a little bit about each of your roles at Microvellum. Um, and so, you know, Lenny, your role is, is head of uh, product engineering. You know, obviously that, that role's uh, evolved over the years, but um, can you explain what that role entails and what your responsibilities are at Microville? Sure. Yeah, I've been um, using Microville, well, since probably 25 years. I've been with the company or with Microville for 18 years, but my primary role now is to kind of oversee the overall yeah, direction. You know, there's a lot of different things and just make uh, coming in um, into play. And, and I'm responsible for the, the testing and the direction and, and helping go in a certain direction. I also work with development, the, the, the other department of our company, right? The programmers. So, you know, if I, if I, if they make a change, I'm also kind of by default, I'll keep an eye on things like, Oh, um, you know, you made a change here, but it's going to affect the library. I so, you know, we need like a librarian perspective, right? Or even just my years of building cabinets, you know, I I kind of grew up breathing and eating sawdust since I was old enough to push a broom, you know, so I, um, I've i seen a lot of cabinet manufacturing. And so I can help with those kinds of trade knowledge things in, in how we um, develop the software itself and you know, beyond the libraries. So that's kind of my, my role um, and uh, in a nutshell. <laughs> so, you know, in, in layman's terms to kind of uh, explain for anyone that's not familiar with Microvellum, there's, you, and you touched on this, you work with uh, development and development is, are the team that's actually like writing the code and of the software itself, right? Yes. Um, and this is what allows the application to work. Um, and what you're doing, you know, product engineering, um, and really the three of you, if I understand correctly, are all involved in, in product engineering, which entails mostly what we call the library as microfilm users, right? Um, so you've got software development that's making the software run. And then what you guys are working on is the, the product library and the products that the software uses, which allows us as users to actually get output from it. So when yeah. we put a cabinet in from the library or the catalog um, or a piece of hardware or material, that's the library, that's the products, everything from how, what makes it draw to what makes it um, output to your machines, that's the library, right? Um, for, yeah, for you can break it into two them. different things. You know, the program you get a micro vellum update and you have no control over what's going to happen. I mean, it's just, boom, that's your version. Right. So you, you know, whereas the library, it's kind of yours if you want, you know, it's, it's just a bunch of workbooks. Right. And so we, we, now we do have library updates, which we can talk about that later, but 
Yep. So we are getting into being able to update a library, but generally it's your own data. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's a good maybe analogy. If you're familiar with Excel, there's the software, but everything you do with it, the workbooks, if you have a file um, and templates, all of that is is similar to the library and the products in Microbellum. It's, it's really exactly what you're using it for. Or in AutoCAD, if you've got a CAD template, the drawings themselves, that's what you use, use it for. And that's similar to with your product library. Yeah, and technically you could get Microvellum and not even use our library and just build one from scratch. But most people aren't in the position to spend months and months and months, you know, it would take to come up with a parametric, dynamic, something usable, you know. Although we have had companies do that. They they look at our library and say, well, that's interesting. And they just literally, they have maybe a bigger company, they have resources, they can just build a whole library from, from scratch to suit their exact needs. It's quite an endeavor. You know, but uh, they've done it. So, so Jamie, uh, let's talk. Tell us a little bit about your role in Microvellum, and obviously, you've got a, a long history with with the company as well. And uh, I assume have filled many roles. But what does your uh, role entail now, and how does it play into everything we're talking about? Um, yep, yeah, I've been with uh, the company for probably 14, 15 years, so for quite a while. Um, start off just as a a technician on on site training people but now my roles uh sort of change we're in uh develop now so basically i'm coming up with new ideas new products hardware systems uh you know developing quite a bit of the library itself so the thing now that we only have the one library we're all working on the same data so we get a lot more done than what we used to um we're not doubling up all the time so yeah so my, my main role is just uh yeah new ideas you know getting that into the, the library and um, maintaining the library as well. Jamie's been the workhorse for us in the past few years. He's, he knows how to, he gets stuff done. <laughs> and so I'm kind of sometimes running behind him, catching up, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, he, Jamie does an awesome work. I am, I am so, we are very blessed to have him on the team. Yeah. And then that, that works really well as well. We, like, we sort of benefit each other. You know, I'll, I'll fly yeah. through something and Lenny comes behind and goes, oh, what about this? So, yeah, it's, it's been really good. And um, I think that's something that's been really important we've never had before. There's just someone going over that work as well, checking it and um, making sure it uh, is right. So we want to try and get out a, a, a quality product. So It's also good having each other's opinion or perspective on our regions. You know, I'm more familiar with what happens over here in, in the U.S., obviously, Jamie, you know, they just do things very differently. Even the, the nomenclature can be different, right? We had a, that was one of the things we had to wrestle with. You know, it's not a bench top over here. It's a countertop, you know. So we're like, what do we do with that, you know? Yeah, even and, things like ticks versus check boxes. And, yeah, you know, it's a tick yeah. box. <laughs> like, well, okay. You know, some things we just leave. Like, I used to get all stressed about that. But I think Jamie helped me kind of put me at ease. It's like, you know what? Who cares? <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> people can survive. They can rename it. Yeah, it does, like, it no worries. Works. And so and that and then, is important context, though, that up until this library, which I don't think we've talked about, when did the Foundation Library officially first release? 2020, late 2020, I want to say. Okay. Because yeah. we started actually, well, if you include the office furniture, it technically started late 2019, but it was only like this, a special office furniture solution. And so we, we baked that, you know, we kind of hammered out a lot of, we, we cut our teeth on that because we were trying to figure out Imperial metric and how do we going to do all this. And so we overcame a lot of the difficulties with that. And then once we were happy, then we kind of, mo that morphed into regular cabinetry. Right. But previously you guys, had uh your, your roles have evolved now and that you guys are able to more collaborate right and previously you were kind of having parallel roles managing and maintaining and developing parallel libraries right for two different markets yeah i mean unfortunately the very beginning we were actually had almost zero communication uh, sadly it's just you know just how it was we were just kind of we did we kind of mind each other's business you know he, they did what they were doing and we're just going to do what we're doing and, you know, it worked. But um, like I said, for all those other reasons, it, it, we were suffering um, 
because of that. It was not helping us. We, we were doing a lot of things that did not add value to our customers. <laughs> Okay. Um, and Hayden, you, um, you mentioned you're, you're new at Microvellum, um, and you are joining this team, I assume to, um, add some horsepower. You're, you're learning, um, how to, how to do this. Tell us a little bit about your, your background and, and what your, um, role is so far with Microvellum. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I graduated from George Fox university is probably my, is my recent background in, uh, with a degree in mechanical engineering, and then uh, got hired on here at Microvellum. And I've just been uh, learning, like you said, um, learning from both Lenny and Jamie, different types of things, learning how to manage and develop within the library. So kind of discovering, you know, a role or picking up different roles or uh, along the way, kind of helping alleviate some of some tasks that, uh, Lenny and Jamie have been in charge of previously, but, you know, something to kind of help free them up to do some of the more intensive things, taking on some of those roles. So that's kind of what I've been doing. Awesome. What, what, uh, is there anything that's surprised you or, um, you know, things that have stood out in your learning experience so far, this being a kind of a new world and you're diving right into the deep end, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the whole, uh, wood, wood product, industry has been uh, quite interesting to to learn about and figure you know figure out all the different ins and outs of it and what's going on i was um pretty green or super green i guess to the whole entire the whole industry itself so it was it's been a it's a continual learning learning process but it's real intriguing and interesting so i've been liking it aiden um, has also got a knack for rendering too we found yeah so he's been helping us do some some rendering, that, yeah, likes doing that. Great. No, that's definitely. Um, I think that I assume that that'll also uh, help with uh, the new library because I know there's some pieces in the foundation library that we didn't have before related to rendering and, and that type of stuff. So um, now that we've got you guys introduced, um, talking about you know we're talking about the foundation library, but let's. First, talk about what are the real differences between the foundation and the previous libraries for, you know, our listeners who maybe are on a previous library and are curious about the foundation library. What what really is the difference? Well, I guess I can take a crack at that. I would say um, well, there's a lot of differences if you think here. One of the biggest is um, it's it's built to accept future updates and added features. So that's why we named it foundation is not an accident. It's we intended it to accept updates much easier than what previous libraries. We really struggled with that. And people would get a library, you know, and then within two months it was outdated and they were pretty much stuck with it, you know, and they, a new library would come out and it was very frustrating. They're like, Oh, I want that. But they were just like, well, you know, you have to spend 50 hours to re, you know, to set it up again. So we recognize for years that's been a problem. So that's one big difference. Um, it's also, um, Jamie touched on this uh, a little bit. It's one, the, the, the single database is both, can be both metric or imperial. So previously, you know, in the North America market anyway, we had to, con we had to maintain two sets of two entire differently you know, databases. So, and including the CAD graphics, we were doing everything twice practically. And this was a huge burden for us developers that, again, no gave no value to the end users. You know, we even created, um, you know, it was one of the things that development helped us with is that we had new Excel functions that we can populate in there that would just automatically, you know, so that global variable, for example, can just be either metric or imperial. Whereas before we had hard numbers everywhere were sprinkled. Hard numbers. Yeah, I think that's uh, important the third thing, to, to talk about. The, I just say, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that on that note, like, so to support the ability of this new library, um, there were certain tools that development created that only this new library leverages so far, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's not that the old library couldn't also get it, but someone would have to, you know, take the time and 
put that in there, you know, especially because a new Excel function, you know, we're just going to put it in the library that we're currently doing. And there's things about uh, regions too is another thing we had to overcome. And that, you know, this is, uh, there's, there's literally a global variable now that you say what region you're in and this can change things. Like, you know, if you set it to Australia, you know, the door swing lines will, they get reversed, you know? So there's just peculiar little things that it's like, Oh, wow. You know, but so it's no problem now because now that we just have it in there. So when you're in Australia, you just set that and you're done. Um, availabilities, right? Some, the hardware guys, they, they'll market um, things differently from different countries, even to the extent of different available heights or depths on a drawer system. You know, they may only have three depths in one country and five depths in another. So we have to contend with all of that. So that's baked in there. That to just automatically happen when you set the region. And so the, things like that, you know, some of those things like you guys maybe had accounted for previously, but had done it in non-native ways or not as simplified ways. And now there's better functions. And I guess maybe to explain that a, just a little bit deeper for people. So uh, e even just conversions of units in the past, right? You had functions that handled this but they were more complex and and had to reference variables that a yeah. user could go in and, and break, for instance. Um, and now there is native functions that is unique um, and explicitly for that purpose. So like Yeah, that, well, that it, was, again, because there were so many different people doing data development, there was like 18 different ways to convert a number from imperial to metric. And it was just a mess. You know, it was not uniform. Plus, someday I'd like to develop a utility that you just push a button and it finds all of those values and basically cooks them. You know, because like, if you're a company and you're thinking, I'm only going to be metric, I would never in a million years be imperial. So I want to push a button and it's going to find all those, you know, conversion uh, expressions and just cook it to be hard lock metric, which is probably what you'd rather have. You know, we can't develop that way, but as an end user, you may want that. So I, I would. Expect someday I'm gonna if I can get if I get my way I'm gonna get that. To <laughs> yeah, I, I think too the great what great thing about these these functions as well is you find a lot of hardware does from is from Europe and it does come in metric sizes. So even if in, you're in the US, um, you can still punch in a metric size and convert it. So you can either we can convert a metric to imperial or imperial to metric. So Either way, you can type it in in parallel or metric and it will convert it So in the one library. Plus, we have a function there where we can have a imperial value and a metric value as well. So you can put both values in as well. So it, it, it really does um, help us out quite a bit. And, yeah, there are a lot of things, like even when I'm developing hardware from the US, a lot of it's imperial. So I'll start writing it in imperial um, and that will convert it. So, yeah, quite a handy little function. Are there um, also things related to that region function that, you know, for instance, costing, um, like whether it's U.S. dollars or other currencies and things like that? I mean, we talk a lot about metric, yeah. but I assume there, I mean, there's, there's language, there's like you mentioned the dashed lines, there's other things that it can be affected or may be affected by this that can be controlled with these built-in variables. Um, Pricing-wise, like the... The reports we do, we do have rep pricing reports, which will, will um, especially for the UK, been in pound. So we can convert that. You know, Australia and New Zealand, pretty much the same. We're using the dollar, so dollar sign's fine. Um, we don't really have a function yet for different pricing for different regions. Um, that's just the one pricing. But generally, most of our customers are going to put their own pricing in anyway. Um, it's not something we pre-cook into the library. Um we put some some basic pricing in there, but then the customer will go through and through all the hardware and the materials and put their own pricing in. Yeah, so I mean, either way, they're going to put in their their pricing relative to the units. It just might change from dollar sign to pound or something, like you said yeah. in the reports. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a variable that will, like Jamie said, you can set what symbol you want to use, and then that'll work its way into the report. Um. Are there any common misconceptions, you know, about, uh, well, one, these libraries um, or just microfilm in general that uh, you find kind of 
rear their head when, when people start thinking and talking about this? Well, let's see. How about you have to be an AutoCAD or Excel wizard to work within Toolbox? Right. I mean, I, when I started, I was, like I said, I was spraying lacquer in a shop. <laughs> I was like, and I just had an, I don't know, I just got stubborn. I used my stubbornness to just figure things out. And um, as soon as I saw that spreadsheet, I was like, you mean all I have to do is, is copy this row and paste it and, you know, to make a new part? I'm like, I can figure this out. You know, and then we had some big formulas and I was like, at first it was kind of intimidating, but if you just really stop and think about it, I'm like, actually, this is not that hard, you know? So I, I don't know. I think it's, maybe I'm just odd. Um, I think that's a misconception that it's so difficult or you have to, you know, AutoCAD is so difficult. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. I think it's, uh, people can do a lot, especially with the resources of, of, not, of on the YouTube and different things out there. You can learn AutoCAD and Excel. Um, can you think of another one, Jamie? What's another misconception or Hayden? I think that's that's one of the biggest ones. Is it is you know too hard to use? You know, it's going to take too much time to set up. Um, we've, we've got customers that have never turned computers on before. You know, old older customers, and they're running fine with it uh, and and love it. Um, that's probably the biggest misconception that's always been around for Microville. What about just even amongst current users? Maybe misconceptions about this new library that they may have heard, but they haven't actually experienced and, you know, maybe scaring them away from upgrading libraries or even things that maybe were true in the past, right? Of, Hey, Oh, I've got to, I've got to start over and this is going to be you know, a nightmare, right? Um, the, this library is kind yeah. of intend to, to absolve some of those things. I found a lot of times, you know, they'll, 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 re you'll think about, gosh, we had to add this and we had to add that. It's going to take me forever. And then when they really study the new library, they're like, Oh wait, they added it. <laughs> it's in there now. So you really have to be careful. If you don't judge it too quickly because a lot of the things that you may have added, it's in there now as a checkbox, you know? So that's a misconception that I've seen. Um, um, as far as yeah, specific to foundation. Yeah, I think a big thing is, yeah, a lot of people go, it's just not ready. It's not ready for us. Um, and it's been out for quite a while, and and I believe it is ready. Um, it's just a matter of learning it. It's just like Lenny said, unless you look at it, you're not going to know what's in there. Um, and there's a lot more stuff. There's just still a lot of stuff we've got to get in um, from the previous libraries, which we're doing, you know, cabinets and hardware. Um, but this is what we're doing. We're doing pushes on certain things. So, for instance, the next couple of months, it's just a push on hardware systems. Um, so we're really, really sort of focusing on one area now. Which, um, you know, it might be a push on... Uh, stuff we need for the North American market. Uh, so we're going to do a push on that and so on. So, um, and, and the great thing too with this library as well, it's you're not pigeonholed into just using North American hardware as well. You know, we've got all these systems in there and we know what the world's like at the moment for the suppliers and stuff like that. Um, you now have the option to, to use all those because they are in the library. So. Um, would you say also, because I, I know, you know, in the past, it was always kind of a, even for myself as a user in the past was like, okay, do I want to make the jump to this library or should I wait for the next one? Right. And some people may still have that in their mind of like, oh, should I jump to the foundation library now or should I wait? And, and you want to talk a little bit about that, you know, maybe even, that, you know, that can kind of segue us into really the purpose and the vision for this library going forward is very much to remove that obstacle going forward, right? Yeah, I can ex explain, well, from a first, per well, from a, what I experienced, because I used to use Microvellum before I joined. So and we had our own, you know, custom library. And I wasn't, didn't want to start, I couldn't start over. But I was really curious what Microvellum was doing. And luckily, with the way, because of configurations, it's completely safe to install a stock default library, it's not going to overwrite anything that you're working on. And you just, you know, while I'm sitting there at lunchtime eating my sandwich, I just flip over to the microphone library and just check out, okay, what are these guys up to these days? You know, and I would just study it, you know, and just kind of get familiar with it. And I'd see little things that, oh, that's a good idea. And I would like cherry pick a little formula or something. And I'd go put it in my you know, library. And so that's kind of what I did. Um, but now, yeah, now that there's this update thing, um, 
is kind of a game changer. Uh, if and and I wrote down some notes that we can talk about that now or later. But as far as who yeah, you want to talk the, about updating, the update but, utility? Yeah. Uh-huh. So you know, ultimately, you know, to summarize. Um, the the vision right this foundation library like you mentioned earlier it's intended and, and named aptly so is to be a foundation so there are no plans to release a hey this is the next one everything is basically made to be able to be added in and appended or updated this yeah. and, and that you've built a tool to support that functionality natively right Right. There's a reason it took us 20 years to, to do this because this is a huge, this is not the kind of thing that happens every day or every year even. I mean, this is like a two decade occurrence, you know. And so to, if I were to quote, so as far as our purpose, um, I can quote, I think it goes in parallel with Microvellum's overall purpose statement, right? Which is, and if I quote, you know, to create a culture that improves the lives of our team and our clients. So that's the purpose of the library as well. And to add on to that, our mission is to create you know, a software platform and a library platform that will streamline and standardize the processes to clients so they can confidently scale their business. Right? That's our microvellum mission. I think it's the same goes with the library. We, that is what we want. We want to have a foundation, whether you're a small company it just wants to stay small or you're a small company that has ambitions to have growth, this thing, you can grow with it. Um, the last thing, as far as our vision, that's another thing I'll quote, you know, we see a world where people have that freedom and flexibility to create extraordinary things with ease, right? We want this to be easier, easy as possible. And uh, Jamie has always been a really good influence on me to help <laughs> remind me, you know, cause sometimes I have a tendency that I'll make things a little too complicated or I think human nature, we all tend to make things a little more complicated than they need to be. And you always have that person um, can, you know, as a team member can look at it and have honest discussions. Well, actually, let's keep it simple. You just do this. Oh, that's a good idea. So we're always iron sharpening iron. We're helping each other out and keeping it as efficient and simple as possible. That's our, uh, one of my visions for this is it's got to be simple as simple as possible, but yet still powerful. We're not going to take away what we need to do. We need to do it as, as easy as possible. Um, let's see. Um, what else can I say about that? What do you guys think? Any other? Well, I'm, I'm just thinking with with this utility that uh, development's built, it does mean that we, we don't have to have a new configuration every time we put out a library. Um, the libraries are updatable. So we, we can do a patch. There might be a, a draw box where we put the, put it out and maybe the drilling is not quite right. We can now put out a patch and every single person all over the world gets that patch and fixes it now. So, um, and then of course we can rebuild cabinets. There might be something we want to add to these cabinets, new features um, that can just update those cabinets. So it is very powerful in that way that we can update the whole library, add hardware systems. They're not starting from scratch every time. Um, also, with products, um, it's going to override all our products in the library that we've built, but the customer still can save their own products back to the library and it will not touch any of those. Same with sub-assemblies. They can save sub-assemblies back to the library. It will not touch any of those as well. So um, it's safe in that aspect where they've developed their own stuff. It's not going to do anything to them. Um, it's just going to update our um, core library. Um, so it's yeah, very powerful in that way. Definitely rename them when you save them back to the library so that keeps it very clean, including sub assembly. As long as you rename it, you know, and maybe put it in a different category with a new name, um, then they'll be safe from getting overwritten. Yeah. So if I were to, you know, kind of summarize it and, and maybe for some of our, our non-user listeners, if you're a, an owner or a, you know, a GM that's, you know, listening to your engineering department about, Hey, we need to update this, or we should, should we do this? Um, you know, one, uh, what this one what your library is right is if you think of it as a catalog of your products all the materials and all of it in there right um and as lenny was just alluding to like you you have categories so this foundation library has a lot of products probably more products than any library shipping library in the past right um and and very versatile products 
And so what happens with this update utility is it's a native utility into Microvelm that you control. Hey, I want to get this update. You can go download the latest version and say, I'm going to update my library. And what that does at that point is it looks at your existing library. And if that, that same product that was there in the shipping library exists, it will replace it and update it with the latest of everything since your version. So if there's slides that change, if there's new hardware, if there's different logic in that product, but it will at the same time, if you've got a custom product that is named differently or in a different category, it will preserve that and leave that as, as you guys have customized it. And the, the benefit there, as Jamie was mentioning, is in the past, there would be a new library that came out and it was not able to be just appended. There was no tool that was able to say, hey, here's the differences between this version and what I have, and how do I just get what's different about them and, and, and still be functional? That being said, as Lenny was mentioning before, that a lot of times for users feels like uh, an overwhelming thing. Like, oh, I've got to get my IT to be able to install this library, to even be able to look at it. Um, these days, it is very easy. You can reach out to your account manager and ask for the newest library if you're current on support and you have microvelm and when you install that by default it's just going to install it on your c drive as a, as a separate thing so when you go to start up microvelm you can just open this vanilla exactly as it opens as it ships right and that can stay separate and totally on your c drive until you decide hey i want this to be on my server or i want this available for my other users so you totally have the ability to control that without risk of affecting your existing library Additionally, going to this new library, and this was true in the past as it is now, but doesn't have to be an all, in like, hey, we're turning off the old library, and now we're all in this new thing, both feet in, right? Like, they can live parallel to each other um, in your server, in your environment, um, if needed. So uh, there are ways to ease into this um, without like a lot of risk. And I think that's the fear that a lot of people have with this is like, oh, this is this whole big commitment that I have to dive into all at once and make this six month project, right? Yeah, well, I can expand on one thing you said is it's, it is true, it will overwrite the existing products. So that's, that's one thing, but you use the word append. So there's an area of microvelm called the specification groups, right? Where we have our master like template global variables wizard variables, material variables. Um, those we can't overwrite because obviously then it would just, it would put everything back to stock, right? As I'm talking, that's where you set your construction settings, your tool file diameter, your tool, all that's, that's the, there's like a thousand variables in there, right? We obviously could not stomp on that. So what's cool about this tool is we know, you know, from this version to this version, we maybe all we did was add three new global variables. So it will, you know, it'll just slip them in there and just take yours and just boop, just add them. Or maybe this lookup table, right, which is a Excel, you know, table of cells. And we just need to insert a row in here and just boop, just insert. It'll find that defined range and slip it in there, you know. Or it'll find one cell and append in there, you know, maybe it's just a list of available, whatever, features. So it's literally appending things. And is that's that, why it's safe. Is that only if I still have components named the same or it's doing it no matter what? Uh, components, you mean variables? Uh, like if I, you know, if I have renamed my spec group components to something unique. Yeah, it doesn't care about the... Um, the name, because when in the interface, it'll present you with a list of template spec groups and components that it found. Okay. And so you can actually just, by default, I think they're all checked. Right. So you can just let it go to town, you know, or, but if there's one, for some reason you're worried, you can uncheck it. Right. Uh, although if you do that now, you got to be careful because now that component is an older version than the new one. Yep. So you got to know what you're doing. That's why I think it's called advanced mode. You can yep. uncheck it. Okay. Yeah. 
but yeah, just to be reassuring, it's it's not going to stomp on any variables, any of your variables at all. It's just going to add the tables, add new global variables, which we've never been able to do in the past. And that's I mean the biggest thing for updating is we could put all the products in, but now you've got to go through all your globals, through your material pointers, all that, and add all that. So normally you'd have to have a technician out there doing all that for you, put it all in, so it'd be quite time consuming. And have I got all the new globals in there or not? So now it does it all automatically. So right. Our development team was very nervous about this because obviously if we execute this poorly, we basically created a nuclear bomb for your library, right? We can just start destroying people. So as a fail safe, this thing literally has an undo button. So you can run it. And the first thing it does is it backs everything up. Everything that's going to get touched gets backed up and zipped up and put in a safe place. And so then as you're examining what happened, if you're unhappy with the update, for whatever the reason, you can literally just put it in reverse. You go, there's a button right below the update button. There's revert or rollback. Click that and it points you to the zip that it backed up and it just puts everything right back how it was. So we felt like that was a really important thing to do for safety, right? Because we don't want to potentially damage anybody's uh, data. Yeah. And I think I've actually even seen some users on the forums who've, who've utilized that successfully as they've inadvertently, you know, taken some wrong steps on their own. Um, and so that, that fail safe is huge. Um, but also the intelligence you guys talked about that, like it's actually one giving you some options if you are an advanced user, um, to pick and choose, but it's guiding you towards, um, the path that's, that's going to set you up for success. So, um, we talked a lot about, you know, okay, the differences and, and, and uh, some of the benefits. What are, you know, say you're an owner or a leader in an organization and you're either considering, hey, maybe we shouldn't migrate. Maybe I should talk to my engineering team about moving or maybe they're already bringing it up. Um, what are some things that they should think about or consider um, ahead of, you know, making that decision to move? Well, uh, first thing I would say is don't underestimate the learning curve. You know, this library is definitely different. You know, so things like the names of the products and the names of the prompts, things, you know, where things are, you know, it used to be over here and now it's over here, you know. And so you just have to re-familiarize yourself with that. Um, and I think that's why sometimes when people first open it up, it's like, ah, oh, you know, it's, because even I've had to relearn stuff. It's been painful, right? You feel like you're, I used to know the library like the back of my hand. You know, I can go around and do stuff with my eyes closed. And now even I'm like, oh, where is that again? I forgot. You know, it's like, I used to just know. And so that, it can be a little frustrating. But once you, what has happened with me, and I've seen it happen with many people, once you overcome that hump, that things just start to get easier. And then it's just like really easier. It's like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's so much easier than it was, you know, especially you start to see little patterns of how we've kind of organized things, which helps you then quickly, it's all standardized. You know, in the past it was like, well, you know, these products were done by this person and he kind of did it that way. And then, you know, you can kind of tell like, Oh, it looks like someone else did this one. You know, this is kind of structured a little differently, you know, and you, it's kind of like, frankly, it was a little embarrassing that that would happen. But now we make a big point of we don't want it to look like three or four people were working on this thing. It should look like it's all the same. And library designer will attest to that. When you use library designer, it's there's so much commonality between all the products that it, it finds way more unique records if you know how library designer works. Uh, it's just way more efficient. Um, so anyway, that, that to me is one thing I would say if you're considering it as an owner. Well, and something I think that is, you know, and this is part of the vision, right? And it doesn't happen overnight, but that historically, even, you know, one, if you think however, even if you say 20 years, but really even just since version seven came out, right? Which I don't know when that was, 2013, 14, maybe. Or, yeah. Um, so you've had 40 or 50 libraries in theory, right? Um, even with that, even I'm on 50.1, they're on 50.1, two companies. The second we download those, they become unique generally in practice. Everybody goes in and customizes them, right? Um, mm -hmm. the difficult thing about that is you are, 
that's unique to your company and you don't have the resources of the community and other users who you can go and say, hey, does anybody know how to do this in, in the library? Oh, yeah, I have the same library and it's right here. Um, and I'm already seeing that with this library, right, is, is different companies, users can go to the forums and even there's some Facebook groups that Australia and New Zealand are so much more active on the internet for a microphone for some reason. Um, hey, North America people, you guys need to get on that because like we can do so much more. And I see daily on the Facebook groups, they're able to go on there and just say, hey, I'm trying to figure out how do I get this drawer slide to work in this cabinet? And somebody will respond right, right away. Oh yeah, I'm on that same library. And uh, either A, hey, if you get this latest update, it's here, um, or here's where you go and do that. And other software, that's normal, right? Um, because everybody's kind of working from the same sheet of music. And, and that, in, in my opinion, that's like the beauty of the vision of the foundation library is that, okay, now we can start to leverage outside of my engineering team, my company, the community of all the users, and the more companies that adopt this and adopt it in relatively as it comes, right? Customize your spec groups customize you know things but you've got the same product library to where you have what everybody else has and you guys can kind of uh the community can and can grow and teach each other as, as resources yeah that is one advantage of just using it out of the box because then it is what it is and um and for whatever the reason yeah the australian new zealand market which is exploding by the way and users they just love microvellum they for years it's and so but they've been a little bit more like they just kind of use it as it is and i don't know over in the united states i've seen a lot more well we don't build it that way you know and, and that's fine but you know you just, i hope you know what you're doing by getting in there and totally customizing everything okay you are now married to that so you kind of become this other there's really two groups of users there's people that are going to do that and i'm not saying one is better than the other it's just they're just different you just have to understand what you're doing if you're going to go and tweak it that much, <laughs> it's like, all right, man. And you are kind of now, you don't, you don't apply for getting the updates. The updates won't work for you, you know, and for some people need to do that, you know, and don't get me wrong. But if for some reason, if you are able to maybe change your methods, just, you know, use it out of the box with the only thing you've changed is the global variables, man, you know, now you can be in this other camp where you can enjoy those updates. Right. Or even furthermore, like I can take, if I've built a good product that somebody else wants or vice versa, like you can drag it in through database explorer or, you know, um, there, there's so yeah. much more possibility there. And so, uh, this I'm speaking for Jacob, but, uh, but, you know, I think that here in the North America, there's, there's still a lot of like, uh, I'll say ego with woodworkers of, well, Hey, well, the way we do it is unique to us and that's our, our value offering, but there's so much um, missed opportunity there, I think, you know, and, and the reality is when your customers aren't buying from you, they're buying from somebody else and they're happy with the product. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we hold, you know, as those sacred cows aren't really that important and, and aren't that instrumental, you know, and you can still have that uniqueness. But if we can um, really, there's, I, I see a lot of opportunity for, more companies to go further faster um, and really leverage uh, what this library has to offer in everybody kind of having those those same tools to be able to share with each other and, and really um, grow in our knowledge a lot faster. Yeah. Um, um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that it's definitely a help for us as well with, with so many people on it. We get so many ideas and, um, you know, people going, hey, what about this? What you haven't thought of this? Why isn't that in the library? Hey, yeah, that's that's great. Let's put that in. Um, and that might benefit the North American market, or it might benefit both markets or all markets. Um, and that's that's been a real put uh, like really pushed us as well to make it better and better because we're getting all these ideas and um, and and that happens too. So you, you might go, well, hey, we don't have this. I'm going to customize it, but the next update is in there. So it's we're, easier we're, for you really active on that. You guys so. to justify the time of of implementing something that might even be requested by a minority set of group, but you you're able to say, well, we have all of these companies that now are on the library that can benefit from this little bit of development time. Whereas in the past it would have been yeah. like, well, should we add that into the next library or not? 
Now it's just, yeah, we're going to release an update and we can bake this in and everybody gets it. Um, it, yeah, that, it is a difficult thing though. It's, it's sometimes we hear ideas and it's hard to know. Is that really, is it that just that one company that wants that? Or is this something that more people would do? You know, it's like the 80, 20 rule. We're trying to just, we got to focus on the 80. And if it's just this one-off company that has something that's really probably backwards way of doing it, you know, I, I don't want to clutter. We don't want to add unnecessary clutter to our library where it's just more formulas and more bog, you know, more bloat, right? So we're really trying to resist that temptation to just assimilate everything that we come across. And that's what we used to do. I think that's what got us into some trouble doing that. Because then the more you assimilate, the more difficult it is to test, right? So we're having to test all these different features and make sure they all work harmoniously together. Right. On that note, are there any kind of cautionary tales or, you know, examples of, of things that, um, you know, maybe companies that wouldn't be candidates or things that just they should uh, be cautious of in, in um, the decision to migrate? Well, I think if you're a catalog based company or if you have really customized your library and you're, you know, you're making money and everything's going smooth and fine. I mean, yeah, I mean, we're not, I'm not, I would never push it on anybody, you know, if you're happy and that's fine, you know, but there's a lot of people that are struggling. They're not happy with their library and, or if they're having some weird anomalies, that's, it might be a good time to just hit the reset button, get a fresh database. that's doesn't have any, you know, issues that were happening six, seven years ago that you're still kind of plagued with. Just purge all that out. And, you know, when you do something a second time, that gives you the opportunity to really rethink with a new perspective on, well, I know before we set that up and you don't actually really use it that much, you know, so you can kind of reevaluate your decisions that you made however long ago it was and just reevaluate everything. Talk to your guys out in the shop. Hey, do you guys, do we really need to do it that way? You know, just make those hard decisions and, and try to simplify it. I've, I've seen in the past quite a lot too is we know that uh, people come and go and, you know, a lot of companies have been stuck. They've they've had someone develop their library, then they've left and now they're stuck. They've got nowhere to go because no one knows how it was done. Um, mm. So that that can be a major problem and I've seen it happen quite a bit here in Australia as well with, with people doing that. They'll be there for a couple of years, they leave and the next minute, you know, they're trying to, hey, what do we do here? And it's like, well... It was completely yeah. built by you guys, but hey, here's this new library and it's going to do everything you want. But like Lenny said, there's there's so many companies out there as well that uh, um, got a set catalogue and they've got everything set up and their, their business is running perfectly. There's, there's no point updating your library if you're going to do that. You know, If, if you're running perfectly, you've got no, nothing you want to add, um, maybe a drawbox here and there, then you know, stick with what you've got. But um, you, you'll probably find 80% or more of our users aren't like that. Um, so this will, will benefit them. What about, um, non microvolume users? You know, there's a lot of companies out there that are maybe using other software already, um, and are curious about microvolume. Maybe they've even looked at it in years in the past or used it in years in the past. You know, what are some things that, um, uh, those types of users might, um, think about? Uh, Definitely, Microvellum is very unique. Um, you know, it's a privately owned company. You know, we're not, uh, one of the things I like about it, it's not beholden to some kind of large monolithic company that's more interested in profits, if I'm to be frank, you know, rather than improving the lives of woodworking people in the woodworking industry. That's one thing I've always really appreciated is um, I'm talking, I can easily talk to the developers. You know, when I was, before I came and join the team. So I really like that. It makes us unique. Um, it's also unique in that we basically took two, and we've talked about this a little bit already, but we took two amazing software tools, you know, AutoCAD, industry standard, everyone, you know, Microsoft Excel, um, and we just kind of merged them into one. You know, why reinvent the wheel? You know, it's but we just found a way to like peanut butter and chocolate, you know, we just put these two things together and, you know, this peanut butter cup tastes pretty good. Yeah, that's the analogy I always like to use. So. Oh, you can, you can keep your Reese's cups. 
too sweet for you. Um, yeah. So yeah, with that, you know, now we have this environment that's like virtually limitless, you know, into what you can do. It's just an open spreadsheet. So it's so much creative potential uh, for what you can do with it. And because it makes it so unique. Um, I think there's also. Just... Sorry, Mike. Jamie. I'm talking. I was just going to say. I'm just going to say it's one software um, for everything, for your drawing package, for your processing, for reports, uh, for your G-coding, everything. It's just one package. You're not going from, you're not drawing it in one software, then analyzing it in another one, then G-coding in another one and, and pricing in another, which we find with a lot of software, it's, it's broken up into that, whereas we're just one package, um, which makes it really, really um, helpful and, and more versatile, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, if you are unfamiliar with Microvellum and you're listening to this or watching this, there is more information online right now about Microvellum than like ever before. We, 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 there are these limelight videos that have been dropping recently and there's some more on the way and I've had a sneak peek at them and they're amazing. They're really good. Just some nice interviews, you know, with companies who they just wanted to share their experience, of what it's been like. Uh, so be sure to to find those either on microvellum.com or on the community site. Yeah, no, that that's great. I think uh, um, it's important everybody knows um, microvellum.com. Obviously, they have their own website where you can go and find a lot of information. But there's also um, uh, their community, their open source knowledge base and community. So um, it is completely open. You don't have to be a user to go and join and access all of the knowledge base articles, all of the forums you can actually go on there and comment and post questions for existing users as well as see their their activity and, and types of posts that are there questions that have been asked um, from anywhere from beginning users to advanced users um, which i believe is still completely unique to microvel um, in the industry that um, having that open forum um, and and for you know those that maybe are are listening and are just curious and not really in the industry you know What's so unique about uh, our industry's needs of CAM and CAD software? You know, we live in this, from my perspective, we live in this place between architectural drawing and in you know, manufacturing and product design, you know, and so there's lots of software that does very well. You know, if you've got Revit, you've got AutoCAD, you've got ArchiCAD, you've got all these software that are specialized and do these architectural design shop drawings very well. Um, but they don't handle the cam and manufacturing side. And you've got software that is very adept at the product design and the cam side, um, but they're not optimized and very helpful for doing, you know, architectural shop drawings where you have to do a full room of products, you know? So you think of the inventors, the SolidWorks, the, um, there's, there's lots of software that is very good, even Fusion 360 now at, at product design and parametric product design, um, but it's very cumbersome and difficult one to manage a catalog of products um, that outputs to your machine as well as pro producing architectural shop drawings that gives me a whole room with plans and elevations and sections. And so that's the space that we live in that microvome fills. And so, and, and there's other software that, you know, uh, are competing softwares that uh, offer solutions to this in their own in different ways. And, and the reason I've, as a user, and, you know, I've been responsible for making decisions of which software we would use for multiple companies. And I've always stuck with Microvellum because of, um, one, it is agnostic. So when you talk about manufacturing and machining, it's agnostic to any um, specific machine. It works with regardless of what brand you buy, what type you buy. But also, it still leverages Auto, AutoCAD. And there's always kind of this mindset, you know, historically of like, oh, microvellum is good for boxes and cabinets when I can pull it out of my product. But what am I going to do with all this custom stuff? Um, one, you can still just draw it in AutoCAD. Um, you can draw it in AutoCAD in 2D, like you're still in AutoCAD. You can also model it in 3D and analyze it and make a product. Um, and, and so there's kind of like a spectrum of how complex you want to go about it and how skilled you are in using the software and, and how detailed you want, how much time you want to spend up front versus at the end. But, but it, it, it enable all of that spectrum um and so that to me is the, the the beauty of it and and really what's unique about it from some of these other offers offerings you know if you're very much hey we have simple products and a fixed catalog um 
it serves that purpose. You know, I mean, one of the highlights of, you mentioned the, uh, I'm sorry, they're not called highlights, the um, limelight. Limelights. Yeah. One that yeah. was just actually published, I think, Amico, um, mm -hmm. is a great example of something that is really unique, really specialized. They make hospital head walls um, with complex hardware, and they're using microvolume to do all the shop drawings in 3D as well as the, the manufacturing output for both CNC machinery as well as reporting and, and things like that. So um, it's very adept and capable, but also um, very user friendly if you're you're looking for something that, you know, I just, hey, I want the catalog out of the box. We build catalogs yeah, think, and do that. Yeah, that's very well, well said, Jacob. And the only thing I would add is, yeah, there's software that can do one product parametrically even. But what Microvellum has is a library of these things. There's tools that you can literally, you can have 800 parametric products and you later decide, I want to add something to all of them. Well, you don't have to sit there and visit all 800 changes. You just have a tool that just scans them all and just, whoosh, just add stuff. You know, it's like, that's so powerful. Uh, and that's something that people don't always fully appreciate, I think. And a lot of even current Definitely. users don't realize they can do those things too as well. You know, like, hey, I've got yeah. a whole project of base cabinets that are 34 and a half and I need them 34.75. Hey, I can go to my product list and change them all. And that's a whole nother reason we didn't even talk about benefit of foundation is because of the structure, um, library designer is a whole new tool. You know, beforehand, the library was so haphazardly, you know, there wasn't anything really consistent from category to category, but because of the foundation, you know, we started with one master product that can be base tall upper. And then we, we cloned that, you know, however many times that we needed. So really all, you know, dozens and dozens of cabinets are really all the same product. There's just a couple of different variables that, you know, but because of that, it's all uniform, like common parts. So you go to library designer and it's like, Oh, this is easy. Tick, tick, tick. Yeah, I actually I had a one we were helping we're actually helping a client move from IX to microvellum and into the foundation library and we're drawing a project um in there and one of the products um it was they needed a one door sink ADA sink cabinet which isn't a product right out of the library but there's a two door ADA sink cabinet but essentially it has the logic to make become a one door right and yeah. so you know once I figure that out oh it and we're getting nerdy details that you know not everyone can understand. <laughs> but if you use the foundation, like doors are faces now, and there's an option. Hey, I've got no faces. I've got a two door, or I've got a left swing or a right swing. Um, yeah. In the older libraries, those were separate parameters altogether. And so, even though this product was a two door, didn't have the option. I went yeah. into my part properties, went to that prompt, put in left swing. I had a, a one door. Um, so there's things like that, like as Lenny was saying, that was unique. Not in older libraries, but once I figured out that logic, I could use that in any of the base cabinets essentially. And now that I understand how it works and it, and, and that's opens up a lot more opportunity, um, to, to be flexible with, without having to really go into the spreadsheets and do yeah. a lot. Well, you're talking to three spreadsheet nerds, so we're going <laughs> to slip into the nerds, nerd yeah. heaven. If you don't, if you're not careful, we'll nerd out all day. Well, I think this was a very good, and honestly, I, I would love to, um, talk more to our nerds and maybe at a future episode, we can go really in depth and I, I definitely know we're going to have those audiences in the future. Um, but we covered a lot of, uh, uh, ground today and I think gave everybody a really good overview of the foundation library. Uh, is there anything else that you guys think we wanted to share or, or touch on, uh, before we, um, wrap things up? Um, what do you think, Jamie? You got? Well, just just thinking with with everyone we think we've been talking about is it is an easy use. Like before, we'd go, "Hey, let's put this option in," and we'd think about it and go, "Oh my gosh, it's going to take so long to put it in. It's going to take a week to to do it." Now, with the structure, you look at it and go, "Oh, I don't really." Oh, hold on a minute, that took me twenty minutes, sort of thing. It's so quick to add new features, adding you know hardware and stuff like that. So, just by building this foundation and and having the same logic in all the cabinets, it's so quick and easy to go through all different cabinets and add the same thing, same insert. That insert can just work in just about every single cabinet, and not just the foundation. But we've got closet library, we've got uh, um, office furniture, and they all use the same inserts. Face so it's frame. not like you have to build. 
yeah, face frame. You're not building all these different inserts um, and, and hardware for them. It, it's utilised throughout all these different expansions as well. Um, and you do have those expansions. We've got a staircase library as well that we've built. Um, so, you know, companies can branch out into the, to different um, stuff as well, whereas before, you, you know, it'd be a little, little bit harder to do so and incorporate. You'd have to have all different libraries to do that. So. Yeah, we've got some exciting things in the works too. There's waste bin pullouts, corner pullouts, kitchen accessories. We really want to make a push to get a little bit better uh, residential market over here in the U.S. I know um, we've sometimes struggled in that market. Um, we've had a little bit better success in commercial, you know, institutional, but we know we can do a lot better in, in kitchens. So that's coming. I think our future is feeling, looking really strong. There's a lot of companies that are moving to CNC automation because of the labor shortages and stuff. And so we're really seeing some good steady growth. So I'm really excited about that. Microvellum is you know, also active, actively in, uh, investing in library data. And so it's getting better and better. Awesome. No, that's exciting. Yeah, that's, I know you guys mentioned a couple of times you're making a big push on hardware. Um, be able to get in the library, which just, you know, opens up a lot of opportunities for everybody and it, it very easily um, can be pulled into any of your products by the way you guys have built it. Um, so, you know, as we, we mentioned a little bit before, but anyone who's interested in finding out more about Microvellum um, or the foundation library, um, I assume they can go to microvellum.com um, and you also on all, all the socials, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, yes. Vimeo. Um, lots of content um, people can go visit there, right? Yeah, and, and community.microvellum.com is the community. It's free, like you said, open. So there's a knowledge base if you want to learn all the technical stuff. And there's articles, um, news, you can news threads in there, and the community. Yeah, people talking about different things. So be sure and check that out. Awesome. Well, thank you guys uh, for joining me today and talking about this. And I look forward to. Um, Hopefully having you guys on again in the future. Yeah, Jacob. Thanks, Thank Jacob. you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Do you want to stay up to date about industry insights, new content, and our community of mill workers? Go to duckworksmw.com to sign up for our newsletter. I'll see you in the next episode of Verify in Field. <laughs>